Welcome to Discovering. It'd be pretty hard to live in the Upper Peninsula without somehow being affected by the outdoors. We'll take a look at some of the many groups and organizations who work hard to enhance the hunting, fishing, and wildlife for the benefit of all. Wildlife Unlimited, basically, after Plum Creek cut the rest of the trails, we came in and enhanced them by planting them with clover and turnips. This body of water is called the Peterson Pond, and it's been used as a walleye rearing pond until the fish are harvested. This is the sole project of the uh, Beatty Not Great Lakes Sportsman's Club. And we'll check out the Wildlife Unlimited Banquet in Delta County, plus hear from the DNR with this year's grouse and woodcock forecast. That's all tonight, so sit back, put your feet up. It's Monday night and time for discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. You'll find it in every county, every small town, every community from one end of the UP to the other. Groups, clubs, organizations, businesses, and individuals working to improve the overall landscape of the Great Upper Peninsula Outdoors for present and future generations. Tonight, we'll take a look at just a few. First, a trip to Iron County for a look at a GEMS project, a joint effort between Wildlife Unlimited of Iron County, the DNR and Plum Creek, along with local businesses and individuals. GEM stands for Grouse Enhanced Management Sites, and, and it's a combination of things. It's, it's places where we're intensively managing habitats. It's places where we're creating walking trails so that people can walk through those intensively managed habitats. We're gating those trails off so that you can be secure when you're, when you're doing that walk. You don't have to worry about your dogs getting hit by a vehicle. If you've got a young kid, you don't have to worry about, about that. Um, so we're trying to bring all the components together. The management plans for these areas are such that they're going to manage aspen at different age classes so that you'll continually have that good um, age class interface that you need for rough grouse and you'll also have good woodcock habitat. Well this is right up our bailiwick because we promote education and habitat improvement so when we got contacted Monica got us started out of Crystal Falls office, put us in touch with Plum Creek with uh, Pat out of Cleveland, or Ohio anyway, to coordinate everything. We applied for a grant from the DNR. Wildlife Unlimited, basically, after Plum Creek cut the rest of the trails, we came in and enhanced them by plowing them up, putting fertilizer and lime on them, and planting them with clover and turnips to get better habitat for the, the grouse, woodcock, turkeys, deer, bear. And in a nutshell, that's what we did, and then we paid for some of the cost of putting gates on some of the roads to keep the four-wheelers off of the trail so they don't tear things up. It's unfortunate that you have to do that, but you do. And then we built the kiosk and uh, framed the sign up. As far as Plum Creek ownership in the Upper Peninsula, we own 580,000 acres. Uh, where we are today, uh, we manage 60,000 acres in Iron County. We've got 21 full-time employees, and uh, more than half of those are made up of uh, on-the-ground foresters that uh, really spend good portions of their uh, daily work in the field and uh, taking care of day-to-day -day operations. We're at the GEMS project today, and this is just another one of the examples that we have of um, the cooperative projects that uh, really uh, emphasize wildlife habitat management and uh, public access to some of the areas that we manage. We do projects like this all across the UP and, as a matter of fact, across the nation. This is just an example of uh, some of the things we do to uh, go along with the, the principles of SFI, uh, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and really meet some of the uh, important objectives that, that uh, we follow day to day.
I'm here today for the gems dedication, the gold mine gems dedication. The Rough Grouse Society is very interested in gems and we consider them an important attribute here in the northern Michigan and Michigan itself. Uh, it's a great recruitment tool for hunters, especially rough grouse and woodcock hunters. Uh, gems provide a location for hunters that are new to the sport as well as those that are seasoned to come and uh, basically a destination for hunters to come and, and hunt grouse and woodcock in a particular location. Walking trails associated with gyms provide an easy location to take a young person or somebody who's mobility challenged. They provide, uh, not only is there food here for birds and other wildlife that attracts them to the trail area, but it also provides an area that's relatively easy for someone to walk. And uh, that includes everyone that's from two years old all the way up to 100 years old. And uh, so that's part of why Hunter Walking Trails are so great, is it provides uh, infrastructure for access. The GEMS is a, uh, it's a system that we've developed across the UP and now it's expanding down into the northern lower peninsula. And what we're doing is we're dedicating areas that are going to be managed specifically for early successional habitat, primarily for grouse and woodcock hunting, but it'll also benefit deer hunters, it'll benefit bear hunters, it's going to benefit um, bird watchers, people that want a place to cross country ski and, and snowshoe uh, without being worried about being uh, have, having interactions with four-wheelers and pickups driving by on the roads. It gives us an opportunity for for youth hunters if we want to get out and mentor some youth. There's opportunities there for older hunters that might not be able to bust the brush anymore. Uh, we've got 10 of these now ac across the Upper Peninsula. This is the first one on private land and this is a great, great partnership between Plum Creek, uh, Iron County Wildlife Unlimited, the Wildlife Management Institute, Rough Grouse Society and the DNR to provide one more place that's going to be just really great hunting for grouse and woodcock for, for the hunters for the foreseeable future. The uh, gems uh, Mary, they bring into uh, um, relationship here the um, local economy because we have sponsors from the local businesses that will give you a discount. If you take a, a picture of yourself next to the kiosk, you'll get a discount when you go into that, that particular business. Uh, so we're, we're tying into the local economy. And one of the big impetuses for the gyms was the fact that we recognize that there's increasing pressure on us to not own so much state land. So we wanted to be able to justify state land ownership through the economics of hunting and bring our hunting community together with the local economy as well as, in this case, with a large major landowner who has to make money off from, off from the ownership of their land. So they're going to do so in a way that benefits hunting. Well, we're all very passionate about hunting and we all care about the future of hunting. And youth are the future of hunting. And so locations like gyms or youth hunts, anything like that is a good opportunity to get young people involved. And when we get young people involved, we're basically guaranteeing the future of our sport, something we care very deeply about. And so one of the reasons why we're here today representing the Rough Grouse Society is because locations like gyms do provide a great opportunity to take somebody young or somebody new to the sport out and uh, give them a good time, give them a good location to go and focus on. The middle of September marked the opening of small game season here in the UP. For many, that means grouse and woodcock. I talked with DNR wildlife biologist Monica Joseph for this year's forecast. Uh, we're expecting the grouse season to be fairly good this fall. Um, we are at what normally would be the bottom part of a 10-year cycle for grouse. However, grouse numbers, both drumming counts in the spring and summer observation of broods, we anticipate that the season will be much better than expected. So it, it tends to be a little spotty when you get to the low portion of our cycle, but bird sides were, sizes were good and the majority of birds that we do shoot in the fall are young of the year. So knowing that, we expect a, a pretty good hunt this fall. And as well, our woodcock are stable and holding their own locally. And so of course the best woodcock hunting will happen if you're catching the flights coming through and our birds just staging up. So we are expecting a season very similar to last year's season for woodcock. If you're going to go out and hunt grouse and woodcock, what you're looking for is 
particularly the aspen timber type. And what you're looking for is a uh, young aspen stands, but also a variety of different age classes in close proximity to each other. And you'll be most successful if you find that very often. If you look on the transition between the upland aspen type and your lowland types, you tend to do very well for grouse and you will also pick up the woodcock that are keying in in those more wetland environments where they're able to probe for their major food source, which are earthworms. From Iron County, we head east to Elger County, where we'll meet up with the Beatty Knox sport fishermen and some walleyes destined for Delta County. This body of water is called the Peterson Pond. It was constructed back in about uh, 83, 84, and it's been used as a walleye rearing pond uh, through 2015. The uh, Bays Dinock Great Lakes Sport Fisherman of uh, Delta County is the uh, uh, sportsman club that manages and uh, sponsors this pond. The uh, DNR's involvement, the fisheries division of the DNR, is that they provide walleye fry in the spring of the year and then they send a vehicle or truck, hatchery truck, to pick the fish up in, uh, during harvest time. But in the intervening time, since when the fish were, the walleye fry are planted, until the fish are harvested, this is the sole project of the uh, Beatty Knot Great Lakes Sportsman's Club. The land is owned by the Plum Creek Timber Company and the uh, club uh, maintains or pays a yearly lease for this land to use the pond. The method of harvest of these walleyes are with these uh, fike nets. They're uh, owned by the fisheries division of the you know, state of Michigan. They, uh, they allow us to use those nets. We set 18 nets in this pond. They have what they call a lead, which starts on shore, goes out to the actual live trap part of the net. Most of the fish at this time of year are offshore. So we have to actually drive those fish onto shore where the nets are. So we use a chemical called copper sulfate. It's the same chemical that's used in swimming pools to control algae and that. And it's an irritant and at the right concentration will cause fish to leave the area where it's present and move into where then it is not present, which, is, which would be the shoreline in this case. Yesterday I put in 10 pounds of copper and achieved the concentration which drove a fair number of walleyes into the shallow water and then it enhances or greatly increases our catch of fish and I'll put in another seven pounds of copper today and drive more fish, you know, the fish that we didn't catch today back in the shore and we'll catch more of them tomorrow. You'll see uh, me and, and a uh, high school student in the water uh, actually pull the nets in the shore and we have two or three people in a boat with a live tank or a big uh, stock tank with water in it. Uh, we uh, pull that net in the shallow water, lean it up against the side of the boat, uh, tilt it up, open up the strings on the back of the net and actually pick the net up and then shake the fish into the tank. Uh, we'll do that for two or three nets until uh, we feel we got it, uh, enough walleye in that tank to justify a run back ashore and not, not endanger the fish you know, with, with uh, lack of oxygen in that water. Once the fish come back to shore, uh, they're yeah, sorted. This year, uh, we've got a, a problem with bullhead. And I think that they were a factor in the survival of the walleye this year and probably also a reason why they didn't get quite as large as we had hoped they would. They're, they're a direct competitor right now with the walleye for, for these small fatheads. So the fish are brought back to shore in that tank and then today they're, we've got a crew on shore sorting. So they go through and pick out the walleye from the bullheads and then put the walleye into that large live cage on shore. There they're going to be held until the DNR comes today and then actually uh, counts the fish and loads them up on a hatchery truck and then transports them to the Rapid River fishing site where they'll be stocked. Historically we have harvested inch and three quarter to two inch walleye from this pond and the food base for those fish was zooplankton. We wanted to do something different starting in 2014 so following the harvest in uh, June, late June of 2014 of a couple of hundred thousand inch and three quarter to two inch walleye I asked the DNR to chemically reclaim the pond, which they did in early July. By late August of 2014, uh, Hilger Bait Company introduced approximately 100 pounds of large adult fatheads into this pond. The objective here was then to 
allow these fatheads to start uh, reproducing in large numbers to provide a food base for future walleye and it, with the attempt then of these stocked walleye to grow to this six, seven inch size. I have been monitoring this uh, pond since last uh, October and at that time there were just clouds or large schools of these fatheads uh, in this pond spawning and I saw two or three different age classes of, of fatheads actually resulting from spawning in the fall of 2014 and then they overwintered well into the spring of 2015, this spring, past spring, and in by the middle of May there were still large clouds and uh, schools of fatheads and uh, everything looked good. By the middle of June we did see or I saw a dramatic decline in the minnow population. This was actually before the walleye were stocked uh, and I, I was alarmed and that uh, channeled itself into my call as to asking for fewer walleyes to be stocked because I wanted the uh, to have a balance between the food base or the forage base in this pond and the amount of walleyes that were going to be introduced into it. So we asked and the DNR put in 10,000 walleye I think the third week of June of 2015 and then we let those grow feeding on the fatheads that were in the pond up until today and the, the, the video that you're seeing today shows the harvest operations and the and the uh, results of that of that effort. Now we've got I don't know how many thousands of fish today, but certainly thousands. They're not quite as large as we wanted. They're not that six to seven, but they're certainly five to six inches, and uh, a number of large fish in that eight to nine inch category, which uh, are cannibals, but uh, shows the potential of what a walleye can do with uh, with a good food base. Basically, not Great Lake sports fishermen are in the process of finalizing the uh, leasing of a second pond which is found just to the north of the existing pond here. Uh, Plum Creek has used that uh, undeveloped site up there for a gravel pit and uh, they're uh, finished completing removing the gravel from that pond so now the plan is to uh, uh, obtain the lease and the permit necessary permits and whatever and then excavate that pond another uh, five feet deeper than it is right now and then uh, actually have a second pond that, to uh, allow us to double our production of walleye from this site in the, in the very near future. So what we did today is I came down from Marquette with one of our uh, fish planting units and met the crew at Peterson Walleye Pond, which is a pond that a local sportsman's club um, helped us raise due to lack of man hours. They took care of the walleye there. We collected those fish out of another walleye pond, transferred them over to the Peterson Pond in hopes that they'd grow to a larger size and plenty fall finger lanes. Loaded the fish up and we made our way down here to Little Bay to Knock where we transferred 2,500 fish um, that should help uh, help sport fish population down here. We have two more days of um, netting and then uh, fish collection and then we'll take care of the fish transport and the fish planting here at Little Bay Nanak. So temperatures were good today, um, even even 68 and 69 degrees so we really like to see and uh, the fish were look good, healthy condition and uh, it was a good plan overall. Five hundred sportsmen and women, food, drinks, over seventy guns, and prizes galore. We're at the Terrace in Gladstone for the annual Delta County Wildlife Unlimited banquet. Well, tonight's our thirty-fourth annual banquet. Uh, we have all of our membership here. There's five hundred members, in, including the board. Uh, this is our big night, our fundraising night. We have a lot of uh, nice prizes to give away to our members. And uh, we're excited, it's a great event, it's a fun night, and we have a really good time. Of course, everybody loves to win a gun, and we try to have as many of those as possible. I believe there's 74 on this year's uh, gun list. And of course, there's also a lot of other prizes, including uh, compound bows, uh, 
tools, everything you can think of we have. All the money we raise tonight uh, goes to projects that we're here in Delta County. We do a lot of work with the Forest Service and with the DNR on their projects. Uh, again, we're a wildlife group, so we cover all animals from insects all the way through the big game animals. Ralph Lundquist, member of the uh, Board of Directors uh, for Wildlife Unlimited, and I am the project chair. And my position is to, uh, to take and follow up on our projects that we approve uh, every year for funding. And some of the projects we do, is, uh, say for the Michigan DNR, this last year we did up by Hendricks on 426, we provided funding for Grouse Hunter Walking Trail improvement and uh, food plot up there. And for the Forest Service, we take and uh, uh, do, have been doing for years, uh, sediment trap uh, uh, development in the streams to catch sediment that comes down the streams. And every year, we put in $2,500 into cleaning them out on a yearly basis. So. Along with stream improvement, we just did, uh, they finished up last year, the uh, northern waters of Carr Creek, which uh, habitat, brook trout habitat uh, uh, project. And, uh, and then uh, go back to this year for the DNR, we had two years ago, we had a wolf that was uh, hit in uh, just north of Escanaba here, or south of Escanaba, and it's a nice black wolf. And the DNR had it. and. They asked us if we would fund having it mounted for the pocket park in uh, the fairgrounds here in Escanaba, which we do have it all mounted now. Our banquets have raised $1.3 million so far over 34 years, all of which has been spent on projects here in Delta County. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, you can join us on Facebook or go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.